So good morning, everybody. Thank you, Neil. What a, a real pleasure to be here. I've known uh, Dr. Reisner and Neil for 30 years plus, and I used to be a fellow at, uh, before I was a fellow, I, I met Dr. Reisner as a young faculty member before I was a fellow, after I was a fellow, and uh, joined the Society of Angiography and Intervention before it had the name Intervention. It was an angiography society, and then interventions were born and uh, angioplasty took off and stenting took off and that's why we're sitting in this lovely auditorium. Otherwise, you guys would be out on the parking lot doing cardiology probably. So uh, Neil was right. I did uh, take to coronary physiology at an early time. I trained uh, in New York City at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital as a as resident. My chief of medicine was a man named Richard Gorlin, also a cardiologist, strange. I'm the chief of medicine at the Long Beach VA now and my young uh, fellow is now chief of cardiology and I work for him on Tuesdays and then when he comes up to the medicine office he works for me. So we have this very uh, interesting relationship. Coronary physiology was developed when I started my uh, experience at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in, in Boston. Uh, we were measuring gradients with small little tubes across renal arteries. Uh, I took to coronary sinus blood flow measurements in the heart with an antiquated technique called thermodilution blood flow. Subsequently, Doppler catheters, then Doppler guide wires, then pressure wires were developed over a series of years in the early 90s. And uh, my experience with measuring blood flow told me that what we know from angiography isn't always the truth, and that uh, some lesions, as I'm going to show you later, are uh, look bad, that it looks like it limits blood flow, but they really don't limit blood flow. And you know this to be true from your clinical experience because you have many patients who have coronary disease who are perfectly asymptomatic, functioning well, and doing great. Some of those people who you might bring to the cath lab would have coronary artery stenosis, who in other circumstances you would say that's definitely a problem. So that was kind of the impetus to understand why there is this disconnect between coronary blood flow and angiography, and can we make better decisions using uh, coronary physiology. So that's basically the uh, essence of what I'm going to tell you today in a little more detail. Uh, I do work, uh, speak, and consult for companies that make pressure measuring systems for the coronary arteries, and uh, some invasive, some non-invasive. And I just want to remind you of the pathology that you're dealing with, and one of our predominant uh, diseases in our cardiology experience is, of course, coronary artery disease, if not the predominant disease. The pathology shows us that we have areas of atherosclerosis that are mechanically obstructive, but may not necessarily be active or thrombotic uh, for most of the patient's life, and other areas which are not obstructive, but may be active for reasons we don't completely understand, that can be thrombotic and uh, produce acute coronary syndromes. Now, the, most of the information I'm going to talk to you about in coronary physiology has to do with stable conditions because in the unstable or acute coronary syndrome uh, situation, there is a dynamic activity of the microcirculation of the epicardial arteries and of the plaque. So it's more of a biologically active system in the acute setting rather than a, a uh, stable and mechanical system that we can talk about for assessing lesions in, in these patients. Now remember, our goals are pretty simple. Uh, when we treat patients with coronary artery disease, we want to treat, I think, principally ischemia and reduce the effects of that. That is, we want to prevent death from MI, uh, serious fatal arrhythmias and shock, and these are acute ischemia-precipitated conditions. And then over the long term, we also want to pre prevent disability, right? We want to prevent heart failure, uh, chronic arrhythmias, and chest pain. And again, both of these uh, goals are achieved, I think, best by treating the ischemic patient and, of course, stabilizing coronary artery disease through uh, primary and secondary prevention. But the question of ischemia is not a simple one. When we think about coronary artery disease, here are two, here's the ring segments of a patient with coronary artery disease. And I just want to highlight for you, this ring segment here on the left would have a normal appearing coronary angiogram associated with it. So the fact that your angiogram is normal appearing doesn't mean you have no coronary atherosclerosis. Obviously, you can have some plaques that are narrow and some plaques that are very narrowed. And we have imaging modalities to understand that while patients are still alive. And we have the ability to measure in the lab the physiology, the blood flow across stenoses, or better, an in-lab marker of ischemia. 
Then we have out of lab markers, and we have in lab markers. So the question is, which is the more important aspect of coronary artery disease that we should be aiming at? And of course, that's a loaded question. It depends on what kind of patient and what kind of situation we're working with. So I want to just return. In the stable patient, I think ischemia and uh, the, the physiology trumps the anatomy, as I'm going to show you. In the acute coronary syndrome, it's a different ballgame, and we'll get to that uh, at the end. Now, <clears throat> there should be little doubt that patients who have ischemia on an ongoing and chronic basis do worse than patients who do not have ischemia. And this is from uh, uh, Nils Johnson and Lance Gould. They compiled a, a, a nice review of the risk continuum of patients who have ischemia by PET scanning, non-invasive uh, method. And in every one of these four different studies that they summarized, if your coronary flow reserve was impaired, that is your maximal ability to achieve blood flow was reduced, again, consistent with ischemic uh, activity. Uh, it can be either microvascular or epicardial uh, obstructions which cause this reduction in coronary flow reserve. You do worse. More events, more events, more events, and more events. So ischemia, I think that's easy. Now, we've grown up, or many of the angiographers and interventionalists in this room have grown up believing <clears throat> that the angiogram, the angiogram tells us when somebody is ischemic. And that's true some of the time, and it's not true some of the time. So for example, in this particular individual, this lesion looks to be very severe. This lesion is of intermediate severity. And if I ask you, can you tell me which of these two lesions is really responsible for this patient's syndrome, you're going to point to the severe one. You may not point to the other one, or maybe you're going to point to every one of them and treat every one of them and put a stent in every one of them. And that may or may not be good. We know the angiogram has its problems because of this two-dimensional imaging of a three-dimensional structure. Here's a little cartoon that shows you an eccentric shaped plaque, and in one angiographic projection, you get a narrowed opening, and in another angiographic projection, the opening is sufficient. So is this, do we have a fellow, are you a fellow in our, our lab today? You're not? What, what do you do? I am a student. A student. Where's one of our fellows? No offense. Okay, you don't have stand-up. Sit right there, because you're so tall, you'll block the screen. So, so tell me, it, which, which of these lesions is ischemia producing, if either one? Based on this conversation, I'm going to pick the LED. But <laughs> you're going to pick the LED. Okay, I don't know if I'm going to give you the answer, but the answer is you can't tell. So you can guess, but you can't tell. And that's, that's the whole basis of this. And actually, this slide comes from an article in the British Medical Journal who asked the question, has simple angiography had its day, and I would put forth that I believe it has, and that we shouldn't be relying strictly on angiograms for decision making. I'll try and convince you of that over this course. Now here are 4,000 patients plotted with FFR against percent diameter stenosis. My, my second question to you was going to be, how do we talk about stenosis? We talk about percent, percent diameter narrowing relative to a normal segment, and uh, to say that doesn't describe everything is an understatement. Now, I'm going to tell you one more time about FFR, hopefully more than once, but at least once, that FFR is a translesional pressure measurement which determines the, the ischemic potential of a stenosis. So here is the correlation between the ischemic potential of a stenosis based on the FFR measurement and the percent diameter stenosis. So how confident are you, my young fellow, in saying that that lesion is 60% and it does or does not produce ischemia? And based on this graph, you would say, I'm not very confident. And that's the right answer. OK. Now, where did we get percent diameter stenosis as a reflection of ischemia? Where did that concept originate? Well, it actually originated right here in Houston with Dr. Gould in 1974. This is a landmark study that says coronary flow reserve, the ratio of resting to maximal flow, hyperemic flow, uh, is a function of percent diameter narrowing of a coronary artery in a dog in which a clamp was put on, a measured re uh, reduction of lumen area, and they found that at 50% or so you start to lose coronary flow reserve, at 60% it reduces more, at 80% it really gets impaired, and above 90% you may even start to reduce resting flow. Well, that's fantastic. Okay, so coronary physiology reflects diameter stenosis. And 
uh, that would be a great thing to have, but it's really not completely true in terms of the reverse. The anatomy doesn't always reflect coronary physiology. Now here's why. This is a, a Dr. Gould study again, simplified, and the, and the relationship is pretty strong and very nice, but when we apply it in human beings, here's the relationship. You get this scattergram, and the reason is very simple. One, the humans don't have clamps on their arteries. They have percent angiographic stenosis, which I just showed you is a very weak marker. Two, they have microvascular disease, so some patients with completely normal arteries or normal appearing arteries can have impaired coronary flow reserve. So the physiology does predict anatomy, but it doesn't predict, uh, but anatomy doesn't always predict physiology. Now, why is it that flow uh, is reduced across stenoses? What produces resistance to flow? And the resistance to flow produces a pressure gradient, which we can measure and then back calculate to our uh, estimate of flow. So here's a stenosis, and there's five or six or more factors which go into describing the features that produce resistance to flow. So in the calculation of flow, which is down here on the lower right across this cartoon stenosis, that the change in pressure gradient is a function of flow times a, a coefficient of friction and a function of flow squared times this coefficient, which is called separation. So energy is lost moving across this stenosis. It's not just the diameter of the stenosis or the length of the stenosis, but it has to do with the recovery of pressure uh, from its turbulent uh, state to back to a laminar state, and it's also a function of the normal reference segment in which this stenosis lies. And that's very important because in a small diameter distal vessel, the same stenosis doesn't carry the same significance as it does in a more proximal vessel uh, in the heart. We also know that if we plot pressure and flow against each other, each stenosis has an individual pressure flow curve. Here are three curves. And each of these is determined by the six or seven different factors, the size of the reference vessel. So there's a lot that goes into generating a pressure flow curve. We know that at, at maximal flow, maximal hyperemia, pressure and flow become linear related on their individual pressure flow curve. So we're going to use that information then to be able to measure pressure and estimate the percent of normal flow through an artery by that pressure calculation. And that will be called fractional flow reserve. So uh, these functions will define how we measure. Now, just on a historical note, I, I don't know how many of our young interventional fellows recognize this face. I know all of our senior cardiologists should know this young uh, German radiologist who worked in Switzerland named Andreas Grunzig, who brought to us this concept of percutaneous enlargement of an, of an artery in the heart, a stenosis, to produce restoration of blood flow. And he was the first of, who's the first of this whole business that we're working in now, but he was also the first interventional coronary physiologist that existed. Why, why do I say that? On his very uh, original catheter, he put a pressure measuring port. So on this catheter, which is 4.5 French, there was a port to measure pressure on the other side of the stenosis, and he used that pressure to gauge the success of his uh, intervention. And the reason he did that, because at that time in the world, angiography was so poor, they had to put crayon marks on the screen to know where they were working, because the angiograms were very difficult to interpret. And he said, if I, get, if I dilate the stenosis, and I eliminate the gradient, and I measure a good pressure, I'm going to have a good result. And that was true in part, but the technology really didn't permit it to go forward, and ultimately it got uh, put on the, on the shelf, and then it got brought back uh, 20 years later. So we now can measure that gradient very easily. We have a pressure guide wire, which we can insert through a catheter. We have a guide catheter, which measures uh, aortic or proximal coronary artery pressure, which is equivalent. And we can measure the distal pressure with the sensor on there. These are 14 thousandths of an inch angioplasty guide wires. We can make this measurement at rest, and we make it during hyperemia. And this measurement at hyperemia creates this linear relationship between pressure and flow and we'll be able to make the computation of the percent of normal flow uh, in just a minute across this. We have these uh, easily interpretable pressure tracings. They're very objective pieces of data. There's no uh, interpretation. There's not much of a, 
a gray zone around the numbers, although the value is something that we can talk about. And when we are below 0.75 or 75% of normal flow, then we know that the relationship to ischemia is very strong. And if we're above 0.80, we know the relationship to negative stress testing is very strong. So we have this range, the very narrow range in which we can use this as our ischemic indicator. I again mentioned that in a normal artery, the pressure in the aorta and the pressure in the coronary artery is the same. There is no appreciable pressure loss. And that when a stenosis is introduced into the large epicardial arteries, that depending on the characteristics of that stenosis, the length and the shape and so on, a pressure loss will occur. And this pressure gradient uh, can be used to calculate the percent of normal flow. Uh, we, we know that the ratio of flow in the theoretic normal artery being uh, this one above and the, the measured flow in the stenotic artery below, and we can take this ratio and compute that. Let me just walk you through it in, in a more simplified format. Uh, we start with the fact that the normal artery has aortic pressure, so we use that as our theoretic normal pressure in the vessel. And we can understand that resistance is equal to pressure divided by flow. If we want to look at flow in a coronary artery, we would turn it over. Pressure divided by resistance is going to calculate as flow. And flow in the stenotic artery as a, a ratio of flow in its same artery in the absence of that stenosis, which would be represented by aortic pressure shown here, this ratio of stenotic flow to normal flow can be measured by distal pressure over aortic pressure. We have the resistances as the denominators of both. And since the resistance bed is one and the same, and we measure it at hyperemia where it's minimal and fixed, we then are able to eliminate the resistance uh, factors and the simple ratio of flows is equal to this ratio of pressures at maximal hyperemia. And this ratio at hyperemia is then called the fractional flow reserve, the fraction of normal flow. Now there are some features of this that are a little more complicated uh, when we uh, have high pressures or unusual circumstances, but for everyday use, this formula works. Now just to relate it again, coronary flow reserve is the ratio of the basal flow to the maximal flow, the line of maximal hyperemia. So coronary flow reserve changes minute by minute, can change over the course of intervention, can change over the course of a day or a week or whatever. Things that increase your basal flow may reduce your coronary flow reserve. Or if you have something that shifts the line of maximal hyperemia, uh, drugs or other things, you can also uh, change your coronary flow reserve. So measuring this value was a very complicated uh, assessment. We could do it at one time, but if the patient became tachycardic in the lab, then the coronary flow reserve measurement 20 minutes later would be different. That's to be expected because it's a, a part of two components, both the epicardial bed and the microvascular bed. If both are normal, the coronary flow reserve will be normal. But if one or the other is abnormal, then your coronary flow reserve will be abnormal. This is not the case with fractional flow reserve because it measures only the uh, values at maximal hyperemia uh, for that patient relative to his theoretic normal value. So we have a percent of normal in that individual and it is unaffected by heart rate, blood pressure, and contractility. So it's a very, I hate the word robust, but it's a pretty robust measurement, uh, unaffected by those variables, reproducible. You can drop the patient's pressure, you can raise the patient's patient's pressure, and the FFR will not change, and that's been demonstrated. Now we have a new contender for lesion assessment, which are some resting ratios. I'll show you those at the end. One recent one is called instantaneous wave-free uh, flow ratio, which is measured on a, a very discrete part of the diastolic period, and it has only to do with the basal measurement. And I'll show you why that may or may not be uh, helpful, but it's something that we'll have to learn about. Again, the importance of what our measurements are is ischemia, right? We want to have measurements that reflect ischemia. And look at all the different ways we try and understand uh, a patient in having ischemia. And we have an acute coronary syndrome set of markers here for really severe ischemia. We have EKG changes, which are evident for, again, significant ischemia. We see wall motion abnormalities, changes in thickening and shortening. Uh, biochemically, we may identify transmyocardial lactate. And at the earliest stages, we may see derangements in uh, perfusion. And this cascade is sort of set on the severity of ischemia over time. 
And when asked, if you had a, developed a new test and you said, I want to test it against ischemia, what would you test it against? What would be the gold standard that you would test a new marker against an ischemic indicator? So let me, let me ask one of my more senior colleagues here. Anybody in the front row want to volunteer? What is our gold standard for myocardial ischemia, Dr. Reisner? Okay, so he says, if you didn't hear him, it's non-invasive nuclear stress test. Is that the only, is that the best standard? Tough question, right? So the answer is we don't have a good gold standard, right? Because the gold standard should be 100% of the time this test tells me you're ischemic. Uh, the, the real ischemic marker would be some way to identify failure to thicken and shorten the myocardium, but we don't have a good test to do that in living man. So we have stress test nuclear, we have stress test echo, we have stress test ECG. And so if I were to introduce a new indicator like FFR and tell you that a certain number says ischemia, I'd have to compare it to all three of those tests. And that's exactly what Dr. Pills did in 1996. Because we don't have a gold standard, he created one. And the standard was three different stress tests non-invasively to identify patients with coronary disease, single vessel, normal LV function that had ischemia. And this is his uh, graphic from that uh, paper in 1996, New England Journal. Exercise, uh, perfusion, and echo. These three columns. Same individual having all three tests. And we do this all the time, don't we? Don't we use three different tests and the same guy do intervention and then repeat it and do three more tests? I mean, the Methodists, there's no problem doing that, I understand. <laughs> Money is no object. So you know that this was a hard study to do, but it needed to be done to perform and identify a standard of ischemia. And he, he was able to establish this 75% uh, FFR value as below which you were ischemic. Now others, of course, we, we wanted to reproduce this as good scientists, and we repeated stress tests, but we only repeated one stress test. So we either did a dobutamine uh, echo, or we did a nuclear perfusion test against FFR or an ECG test, and other values were produced. But every one of the multiple studies, and there are more than 15, every one of them said if your FFR was above 80, the stress tests were negative. So that's good to know. And if they were below 75, they were always positive. And in between, you got mixed results. So that's why a gray zone was created. The recent clinical studies use 0.80, 80% as a threshold for a dichotomous uh, decision point. And I'll show you that. Now, this, uh, this data was revalidated recently, which is very nice to know, in four other studies comparing FFR and uh, PET scanning again. And uh, the linear relationships are good, not great, but they're pretty good, and validated uh, these ischemic markers. The one thing uh, that is really the hallmark of a standard is if we treat patients uh, based on a certain threshold of a number and their outcomes are better when we use the non-ischemic value, or they have more events when they are in the ischemic values, then we know that's really quite the, the standard we'd like to have. And we do know that there is a continuum of FFR values, many below which the patients have high event rates, and on the other side, above which this threshold, they have very low event rates. So this was the relationship that uh, Lance Gould and uh, Niels Johnson put together when they did a, a meta-analysis of this 6,000 patients and identified the fact that medically treated patients did worse when their FFRs were below 0.7 and they did okay and actually much better when they were above 0.7. And the same thing with bypass surgery. They, didn't, they did worse when those vessels were bypassed when they had near normal physiology. Now here's the gray zone that we use for treatment, but this was the uh, threshold that they identified in these studies. Okay, so let's just take an easy case. I'll put FFR to work. Interventional fellow's right here in front of me. I can see him sweating and uh, thinking about this. So here was the case, and I'll, I'll show, you, show it to you again. This is a 68-year-old man, chest pain at rest, occasionally atypical, some exertional chest pain. They put him on a treadmill. He went eight minutes, had minimal ST segment changes, and he had a reversible inferior thallium defect. Here's his right coronary artery. I'm not showing it in motion. I don't think it needs much expository uh, data. That's a pretty severe stenosis, couple lesions. But what about this LAD? So what about this LAD? This LAD is an osteal LAD. Remember, the most difficult uh, interpretations of angiogram occur at the ostea of vessels because of the uh, 
parent uh, branch and the daughter branch overlap. It can produce an artifact uh, which makes the lesion look worse or it can make it look better because of the angulation. So here we have an osteal LAD. Uh, I only have inferior ischemia. Is that true? You want to you want to bypass him? You want to put an osteal stent? You want to treat him medically? What would you like to do? He's thinking. I, can you hear it? I can hear I, it. I would like to do another view and maybe mm -hmm. FFR. This is the best view you get. They, when angiographers don't know what to do, they always ask for another view. <laughs> that's that's a fact. Okay. I can show you eight views. They all look the same. All right. So you got your other view. Here it is. What else FF, would you like to do? Uh, it will need further evaluation of FFR. FFR. Good answer. Good answer. Okay. So if you don't do FFR, you're either going to not treat this vessel because you think it doesn't look bad, and you don't have a reason to treat it because you've got only inferior ischemia, right? And I'll remind the fellows that the nuclear test is only so-so. Any nuclear perfusion doctors in here, nuclear guys? So I can say anything I want, right? Oh, where's it? Nuke? Who's the nuke guy? Raise your hand. Oh, okay, so you know I can say anything I want now. So <clears throat> remember, you can have ischemia in the inferior wall and it can look worse than the anterior wall. It doesn't mean the anterior wall is not ischemic, right? Multivessel disease, nuclear perfusion starts to get weaker and weaker. That's why I still have a job, happy to say. So the answer here is let's measure it rather than guess. If this is my father, God rest his soul, he would get a measurement. Right? Because I don't want to guess right. I don't want to guess wrong. I want to get exactly correct. Okay, so here's the lesion. It looks, it looks bad. Everybody depends on that. But when we measure it, here it is. The pressure wire is in the vessel. And of course, 0.77, it's in the gray zone, but it's abnormal. So this gentleman would have two vessel disease rather than one. You can treat it any way you want. If you want to stent it, fine. If you want to rotoblade it, fine. If you want to, whatever you want to do is fine. Okay, the, the reason I mention this is because it shifts the appropriate use criteria as well. If you have LAD ischemia, as this man has, or if he didn't have it, he would go from this black surrounding area where a lot of his uh, indications would be rarely appropriate. This is in the old terminology, I, meaning inappropriate, but rarely appropriate. And he would now qualify with LAD ischemia into this uh, either uncertain or absolutely appropriate, the green and the yellow boxes. So it... Ischemia does make a difference both for the patient and for your billing and for your appropriateness. Now, there are over uh, almost now two decades of studies. These are 15 years worth of studies. And the three main ones, which I'll show you here at the top, are the DEFER, the FAME 1, and the FAME 2. These are the most famous of the FFR studies. The other studies shown down here are mostly registry studies, but large numbers of patients who have demonstrated that the use of uh, Physiologic-directed therapy is better than the use of angiography or non-ischemic-directed therapy. So let's, let me just take you through these three major studies. So, whoops, let me go back. So the DEFER study was the first study. It's now got a 15-year outcome. It asked the question, if I have a lesion, 60% intermediate lesion, and I measure FFR, and it's above the threshold, negative, above 0.8, and I don't treat that with intervention, I just treat him with medicine, is my patient going to do okay? Because at the time, the doctor said, oh no, I would never leave a 60% lesion asymptomatic behind because it might activate, it might progress, and then I would be in trouble. Actually, he wouldn't be in trouble. The patient would be in trouble, right? But that was always the justification for treating a lesion that didn't need it because he was worried. Well, the DEFER study put that to bed, the DEFER study. And if your FFR is negative across such a lesion, you have a very low event rate. And uh, so it, it paid out. Now, the FAME-1 study said, well, let's, let's validate that concept. Let's treat some of them, and let's uh, treat them with FFR guidance, or let's treat them with angio guidance, regardless of what the FFR is. So that's what they did. They took patients. They randomized these 300 patient groups to these two different strategies. Multivessel disease angiographic, multivessel disease FFR guided, and it turns out that by putting in unnecessary stents, that is a stent in a vessel that had an FFR negative value, you produced a higher event rate. Both death and MI, the combination, and major adverse cardiac events at one year were higher. So it not only made clinical sense, 
But when they did the economic analysis, as you might expect, with one fewer stent per patient, uh, two instead of three, the money worked out much better as well. So this was one of the rare strategies that said, wow, better outcomes at lower cost. I want that. But it means the doctor has to think about it a little bit more. The interventionalist has to apply a little more energy to get this information and get it done. The five-year follow-up of that famed study showed there was no real deterioration or uh, fallback, at least no, not significantly so, and these curves stayed parallel after that, that first year and uh, was pretty good. So this is pretty durable data for the use of ischemia-guided interventions. Now, the Courage study had come out a decade ago and said, oh, no, you guys, all, this, all these patients can be treated medically. Coronary disease is really not important. Uh, all you have to do is treat the ischemia uh, with medicines. You don't need to do revascularization. So th they asked this question in a little more vigorous manner. Remember, the CURD study was a very selected population. They screened 32,000 patients to randomize 2,000 patients to medicine or PCI. And they didn't require ischemia to be of any significant level. In fact, they didn't require ischemia to be present at all. They just had to have multivessel disease and symptoms. So the, the FAME-2 trial, which is what this uh, question is going to be uh, addressed by, asked whether patients with multivessel disease, can I treat you with medicine and you're ischemic, will that medicine treatment be as good as revascularization plus medical treatment? And so the FAME study randomized patients who had at least one vessel being ischemic, and they randomized them to PCI, intervention with stents or, and medical therapy, or optimal medical therapy alone. Now, there was interesting in this group, in patients who they enrolled, sometimes they made measurements of the multivessel disease, and none of them were ischemic. They had disease, like I showed you before, but the FFRs were negative. Well, they followed those individuals as well, but they didn't get any special treatment. Okay, so what happens? At the end of two years, they found that the blue group uh, I'm sorry, the green group is the registry. These are patients who have coronary disease, they're treated medically, they don't get intervention, they have a low event rate. And the group that had positive FFRs for revascularization got medical therapy plus stents, they had a very similar and low event rate. But your patient who had positive FFRs, ischemia, who got medical therapy but not revascularization had a significantly higher event rate over these two years and the study was stopped early. It was stopped because of the events, not because of death. So people criticized the study, oh, it was stopped prematurely, it really didn't meet the criteria. Well, it was stopped for these reasons. The events were unstable angina and half. Now, it's hard to argue with a patient that says, I have chest pain here at rest, and you say, no, you don't. You don't meet the criteria. We're going to keep going here. You're going to get medical therapy. We're not going to do any intervention. I know you have symptoms, but you don't meet the study criteria. So, okay. Those patients got treated, that was an endpoint. Some of the patients had myocardial infarctions. That's an easy one to recognize. And others had unstable angina plus ECG changes, also an easy and hard endpoint. Death was infrequent as it is in all of our PCI studies in terms of stable anginal patients. So this study really did answer the question, I think, that if you have ischemia, medical therapy won't do it by itself over time. You have to get some revascularization. Now, Dr. Park in Korea said, well, let's do this. Let's, let's uh, implement a routine strategy of using uh, FFR. So he did. He, he went from before, uh, before routine use of FFR, which was sporadic in his lab, to a, a, a strategy of using it in every indicated patient, not just those that some operators thought they should do and others thought they shouldn't. He did it on a routine basis. And as you might expect, he shifted the balance of uh, coronary artery disease, both labeling and uh, function, from a higher level. So this yellow, uh, sorry, this purple box down here at the bottom is the number of patients with three-vessel disease. Above it is two-vessel disease, and above that are one-vessel disease. And they shifted the number of patients in, in these categories down to half the number had three-vessel disease, not so much different in two-vessel disease, and a lot... Uh, a lot. Some shifted into one vessel disease. And then look at this little blue group. This is that same group in FAME2 study where multivessel disease but no ischemia. And so they didn't meet that, that criteria. So this was good. And in fact, it, it helps us 
shift those patients that we might have sent to surgery into an interventional approach, uh, a more benign approach, uh, and also identify some patients that really don't need revascularization at all. And repeat revascularization then, of course, here on the right, was uh, lower in the patients who were assessed routinely and not guessed on and not just assumed to have disease. This also translated into lower death and myocardial infarction rates after this routine implementation of a FFR strategy from 5 down to 3%. So that's pretty good. A few strategies which lower your mortality rate. Neil, you're not impressed, I can tell. Well, I'm a little concerned that all the events are occurring up front and the curve is going up. Parallel. Right, so patients who don't get treated don't have stent-related events, and that's pretty much the take-home message for that. So you're not introducing metal into arteries that have the potential to cause thrombosis, infarction, and, and disease progression. Now, <coughs> I've got a collection here of some coronary anatomy, and most of you who are not in the cath lab uh, don't really need to concern yourself with this very much, but these represent dilemmas for your interventionalist. That is, your patient comes to your angiographer and interventionalist with one of these complex conditions, uh, you would like the answer to that complex condition to be the best it can be. And this is where I think FFR really has an important role in helping us manage these complex patients in a very uh, coherent way. Now, <clears throat> if this was strictly just an interventional talk, we would go through the details of how each of these different conditions uh, FFR can be applied, the physiology applied to that individual. We saw this man just a moment ago with osteal LED lesions. This one down here on the bottom shows a uh, stent that's put in a vessel and we pinch a side branch, right? That can be a problem. Here's a left main, I'll show you that in just a moment, and serial lesions or bifurcation lesions also. All this technical stuff can be uh, helped by measuring the physiology because it all doesn't respond in the same way. Now, one of the concepts that troubles <clears throat> many of my colleagues and myself at times is that there is a mismatch between what I see and what the physiology is, that a visual functional mismatch. I look at a lesion, I say, well, that's a very mild lesion. It's only 50% narrowed, but the FFR is abnormal. It's abnormal because there's a large bed and a large amount of blood flow going across that stenosis, and it drops the FFR to a significant level. Now, if you take that same same condition, and let's say you produce a myocardial infarction, right? So you produce a myocardial infarction, the lesion's worse, but the bed got smaller, much smaller because of the infarction. Now you have another visual functional mismatch. You say, oh, that lesion is severe, but if I were to measure FFR uh, at some days after the acute event, uh, I would say, wow, that FFR can be normal or above the threshold, 85. And the reason is because there's not a lot of flow now across that stenosis. It doesn't drop the pressure across that stenosis, and it becomes not ischemic producing anymore. It already did its job. And this condition can also be vice versa. That is, if this is where we start with the myocardial infarction, in recovery, as the bed now recovers or gets larger, the uh, visual functional mismatch can occur again. So for this reason, we have to think about where the vessel, where, where the lesion is in the vessel that we want to treat and not worry about the vessel visual functional mismatch as much as we may need to do. That is, we don't need to treat a lot of severe small vessels. That doesn't help us even though the, the lesion looks bad, the FFR might be normal. Now this is, this is also one of the reasons why we don't use FFR in the acute coronary syndrome, in the acute STEMI patient because the bed may change, and in the non-STEMI patient there may be a, a border zone in some areas that we can't depend on. Remember, if the FFR is positive though in the acute coronary syndrome, it's positive. The problem is if it's negative, will it become positive at a later time when the bed recovers and the flow increases? So that, that is the dilemma of those patients. Let's just take a look at another uh, helpful example. Here is a patient with a moderate LAD. He's 63 years old. He has chest pain, a couple years of fatigue. He had a, a right coronary occluded uh, in 2005, a while ago. He's got some mild disease in the LAD, mild disease in the circumflex, normal LV function. Uh, he came because of chest pain. Do we have another interventional fellow? I don't want to burn this one out. He's working so hard in front of me here. Another one, okay. So. Here you are, young man, 
What do you think? Should it, is it due just to the right coronary artery occlusion and collaterals, or could it be due to this left main stenosis? Such an easy question, right? What do you oh, think? Uh, it could be due to the left main stenosis. Good answer. So how, how would I know that's the case? You could FFR. Good answer again. So <laughs> these are easy questions, right? They already have the answers. How about IVUS? Should I do IVUS? Everybody know what IVUS is? Intravascular ultrasound imaging? Is well, that, a, that a valuable tool? Well, IVUS would give you the anatomic information, but not the physiologic information. Boy, he is well schooled. This is, that is exactly the right answer. So he said it'll give you the anatomy, but it won't give you the physiology. And that's right. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. So this was an easy answer. You can just measure FFR in either or both branches. Here's FFR in the LAD. Here's FFR in the circumflex, 91 and 92. This is a normal left main. You don't have to concern yourself. Normal physiologically, not normal anatomically. That is, if you do IVUS here, you're going to see a bunch of plaque. But it's not obstructing flow. And this gentleman probably could live with this for a fair a bit of time. And in fact, the long-term outcome studies of left main assessed by FFR show exactly what FAME 1 and FAME 2 showed, that they have durable results over time. Now, I asked you about IVUS, right? And you told me anatomy. We'll know the anatomy, but we won't know the physiology. Well, wh how come this IVUS anatomy doesn't equate to the physiology? Would you know why? I mean, look, let me just help you. We, we don't use IVUS for physiology. We shouldn't. It's not an equatable number. You can pick any cross-sectional area of the vessel you want to use as a threshold. And at one point along this vessel, let's pick four millimeters squared. Well, four millimeters squared proximal may be significant. In the middle, may be less significant. And certainly distally, four millimeters squared is the, is the normal cross-sectional area. So that threshold, a single threshold, doesn't apply everywhere in the vessel. And here's that graphic if you were to plot a four millimeter squared vessel uh, area in a vessel with different reference diameters, the percent stenosis shows up here on the bottom. And the correlation uh, between FFR and minimal luminal area, remember that one area, is weak at best. So it's good to the negative. If your area here was greater than four, your FFRs were all negative. So you can use it in that way if you were to choose that. In the middle, a little less, and in, if you're below 2.3, you're a 50-50 chance of having an ischemic or non-ischemic vessel. Now remember, these all look bad on IVUS. You, you look at the vessel, oh, there's a ton of plaque, there's this, there's the adventitia, whatever you want. But the lumen is of a certain size, and part of the reason this uh, relationship is so poor was that, remember, we don't know where these vessels were, where, where the lesions were taken within the vessel. Was it in the middle segment? Was it in a more distal segment? Was it in a proximal segment? Proximal vessels are five millimeters in diameter, and mid vessels are three LEDs. Mid vessels are three, and di more distally are smaller. So it makes a big difference, as we, as we saw from the physiology. And uh, the same applies down here. This is an optical coherence tomography image, which is our latest tool for imaging. You get a much better resolution of the image, but the answer is still the same. A cross-sectional area is not enough information by itself to predict accurate physiology. I'd like to have one tool, but I don't. Now, the, uh, the world of coronary physiology and complex anatomy, from the angiograms I just showed you, people are trying and continuing to approach these as best they can. For serial lesions, uh, we have few outcome studies. These are just in-lab technical advances. We measure uh, gradients, the delta P across lesions, but not the individual FFRs. For the fellows, we don't use FFRs. We use delta P. Now, instantaneous wave-free ratio uh, measurements suggest that they can detect step-ups across these stenoses, and this may in the future be a handy application of this technique, but at the moment it's still quite a research tool. For saphenous vein grafts, yes, we can use FFR. There are outcome studies. And I think it's interesting to recall, we have some surgeons in the room. Any surgeons? We have at least one. And uh, so when you put a bypass on a relatively normal, physiologically normal artery, is it true to say that my anticipated patency rate will be lower in that grafted vessel than otherwise? That is true. So, Your Honor, that's what he said. We're going to report that. So, 
If you bypass physiologically normal vessels, you don't get as good a result as if you bypass those that need it. And I think in this case, uh, for the application of saphenous vein grafts, that's a, a helpful uh, study which is going on now in the, called the FAME 3 study to see whether that approach works. And also the, the treatment directly of diseased vein grafts is a separate entity from normal vessel FFR. That is, we can make the same measurements, but the biology of a saphenous vein graft will be more the determining factor on treatment than the FFR. You can have normal FFR and a degenerating graft, and you probably need to do something because that's why he's here. So there are, there are a few studies on that, but I think biology trumps the physiology in that circumstance. For osteo left main lesions, we've got some data. There's an a interesting uh, problem when you have uh, left main plus severe downstream LED disease. We have to make an assessment of the impact on that. Uh, what else do I have for you here? The, the use of FFR in the STEMI and non-STEMI populations are under study. And again, as I mentioned, because of the active biologic bed, if the FFR is normal, it doesn't mean it'll stay normal over the recovery period. And so we have to be cautious about how we manage our multivessel STEMI patients. Uh, I think one of the most interesting areas in physiology coming on now is the uh, I implications of coronary artery disease in the patients who have aortic stenosis who will be having a TAVR. So if you have LED disease, multivessel coronary disease, and aortic stenosis, what happens to blood flow after you've now replaced the aortic valve and restored normal physiology from the, the global heart perspective? And I, I think there is some, some fair data that says coronary blood flow increases after you relieve aortic stenosis. You've relieved the resistance. You've improved outflow. The transmyocardial uh, pressure head is reduced. Coronary blood flow increases. And if that's the case, if I measure an FFR before TAVR at 0.82, and I do TAVR, I may measure it again after TAVR, and now it's 0.75. So that LED lesion now becomes significant because I've changed the flow dynamics. Uh, there, there are wave um, intensity analysis, which also support the fact that flow improves after TAVR. And there's a, one or two small studies in which a coronary blood flow directly measured improves after TAVR. Now, the, the uh, current uh, controversies in coronary physiology are, uh, arise in the areas of resting flow ratios. Can we get this same information without having to produce hyperemia, without having to produce adenosine, and without having to complicate the measurements? Can I do it with resting information alone? And the answer is maybe. And of course, then microvascular uh, the, the indices of microvascular disease are also an entirely uh, interesting and separate field, which uh, take a little more explanation than I have time to give you today. But we, we do know we have at least seven uh, indicators of coronary physiology, which for the fellows opens up the doors for great exploration and research. So we have our FFR. We have our resting ratios of IFR and uh, PDPA. We have our index of microvascular resistance with thermodilution coronary blood flow down here at the bottom, simultaneous with pressure. These are combined measurements. And we have Doppler flow. Uh, to produce coronary flow reserve by Doppler, flow velocity reserve, basal stenosis resistance, hyperemic stenosis resistance, all calculated with these. And for the bottom line here, we have really one that has withstood the test of time and has substantial data with it. We have some contenders coming into play. Let's just take a quick look. So resting flow and hyperemic flow can be separated. So here are your pressure flow curves, and hyperemic flow clearly separates these curves much better than basal flow, and that's the, the whole contention. The basal flow uh, group says, oh no, we can separate out these uh, severe lesions from non-severe lesions, and the hyperemic group says, we don't think so, not as well as we can with hyperemia. But there are data to, to at least support some of that information. Here's an osteal circumflex lesion, no symptoms, negative stress tests. His IFR ratio across here was 0.97, above 0.94 is considered normal, below 0.86 is considered abnormal, and here's your FFR at 0.87 corresponding. So that's nice that they correspond, but they, they don't always. The IFR ratio is taken during this wave-free period of the cardiac cycle. So here's systole, and you have waves reflected throughout the, the coronary and uh, peripheral vascular circulation. 
impulses of waves travel and come back. Forward expanding waves, backward uh, deceleration waves. In diastole, you get this big deceleration uh, wave, which is reflective of flow. And then during diastole, you get this wave-free period. Uh, at that point, pressure and flow fall, resistance is constant, and the ratio is calculated during this particular wave-free period. And it is thought to have met the criteria of FFR, resistance minimal and fixed. Well, it's almost minimal. It is fixed. It is constant. And uh, so there have been some studies, and one of them was called the Resolve Studies, and it found that the correlation between FFR and IFR was pretty good, you know, at a, at a 0.8 correlation. And you had these two pink zones in which adenosine was unnecessary because the correspondence between FFR and IFR was, was nearly 100%. So that's good, and the ROC curve supported that. But you have this big zone in the middle in which IFR doesn't quite match up, and then your uncertainty is very high. So this is the area of resolution. It will come out of the outcome data that is being performed with the IFR studies. So we know that at this point in time, we have this hierarchy of contenders for uh, invasive physiology. Angiographic uh, uh, accuracy is only about 70%. IFR and PDA about 80%. Uh, nitroglycerin and contrast-induced hyperemia, interesting, moves you up to 85%, and FFR is considered to be about 90%, 95% of whatever our true gold standard might be. So it's a, it's a very interesting time to, to be involved with coronary physiology. Now, lastly, I don't want to underestimate the uh, non-invasive world, because it is really, I think, uh, come a long way. CTA for coronary angiography produces wonderfully uh, vivid images, but you are still stuck with the same problem with CTA as you are with coronary angiography from an invasive approach. I have a lesion. Is it 60% narrowed? Yes. Is it ischemia producing? I don't know. So you need FFR. Can I get non-invasive FFR? And the answer is yes. So HeartFlow and others are now trying to uh, provide us that information. And in fact, there are several different studies, uh, at least three major studies now and, and more that I haven't listed here, that produce the correlation between invasively measured FFR and non-invasively determined FFR by uh, CTA scanning. Using computational fluid dynamic equations and huge computer power, they can generate this uh, FFR map of the coronary circulation. and in the outcome study using that approach with FFRCT, the usual care for patients with planned coronary angiography produced an angiogram uh, in about 70% of these patients. Um, the, the green group are those that uh, uh, did not have angiography. And then when you did FFRCT, you were able to eliminate a large number of patients who didn't need cath at all, and you were able to identify patients who had significant coronary artery disease uh, uh, accurately. So it produced a, a superior result to CTA alone and a superior result to just a strategy of routine coronary angiography. So I think you're going to see uh, a lot of the FFRCT world uh, advances in the next few years. Now, I couldn't resist, so I wanted to, to leave you communicating as our new president will do by Twitter, right? I just want to make sure that everybody can speak Twitter, because Twitter is the new language, as I understand it. So for the fellows, I've Twittered everything you need to know about coronary physiology in six bullet points. And of course, if it's Twitter, it's true, right? Isn't that the, I thought that was the case. Well, I'm not sure that's the case, but um, we're, we're now in a very interesting time uh, of our world life about how information is changed, where we get it, what we get it, how we get it. But I can tell you this, that coronary physiology actually has good, strong data supporting its use for best outcomes. And uh, you won't be disappointed by using FFR. It avoids uncertainty, helps you identify optimal vessel approach, uh, reduces some of the complexity of disease that we'd otherwise have to struggle with, and produces better outcomes at lower cost when applied routinely. So I'm going to say thank you very much.